guys, today's video lecture topic is going to be the cell membrane, which is the organelle responsible for cell transport. Please make sure that you are filling in your notes organizer as you go through the video. Your notes organizer today is a little bit different. It is a graphic organizer. Take good quality notes in each space. Okay, so the first thing you need to do in the top little circle there is define what cell transport is. Cell transport is the movement of materials in and out of the cell. And there is an organelle that is responsible for that, and that is the cell membrane. The cell membrane is responsible for moving things in and out of the cell. That is cell transport. Okay, so just a quick refresh. Um, remember, you have the cell membrane and you have the cell wall that are these outer structures. Some cells have cell membranes and cell walls, so plants, fungi, and bacteria. And then some cells, like animal cells, only have the outer cell membrane. But in every type of cell, the cell membrane is responsible for moving things in and out of the cell. So all cells have a cell membrane. Every cell needs to be able to move things in and out. The general structure of the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer that's made up of proteins and lipids. Okay, so here's the phospholipid bilayer. That is the overall structure. That's the overall structure structure of the cell membrane. So the idea behind the cell membrane is that it's porous, which allows water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nutrients to pass through it very easily. Okay, they can sort of wiggle their way, those nutrients and molecules can wiggle their way through the phospholipid bilayer. That's what porous means. <clears throat> The cell membrane separates the components of a cell from the inside to the outside environment. That's why we call the cell, the cell membrane the gatekeeper of the cell, okay? It controls what goes in and out of the cell membrane. We call the cell membrane the gatekeeper because it is semi-permeable. Semi meaning somewhat, permeable meaning it allows things to pass through it. So only certain things are allowed to pass through the cell membrane, okay? You want to make sure that good things are coming in and bad things are coming out. You don't just want to let anything in and out of the cell. So the cell membrane's job is therefore to maintain homeostasis, that stable internal environment, that balance. So that is one of your blanks there. It helps maintain homeostasis within the cell. And then this idea that we have this phospholipid bilayer where things can float and sort of move within the phospholipid bilayer, that's called the fluid mosaic model. So if you look at our picture of the cell membrane here, we've got things like embedded within the flexible double membrane of the, of the cell membrane. So that is the fluid mosaic model, that proteins and other materials can float within the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. It's a very fluid and flexible cell structure. Okay, so passive transport. Passive transport is just a general term where you're talking about the movement of molecules from a high to low concentration that does not require energy. So under passive transport, make sure you underline that it is going from a high concentration to a low concentration and make sure that in big capital letters you write that it does not require energy. This is what molecules want to do. Molecules want to go from a real crammed together position to as spread out as they can. Okay, so there are three types of passive transport are going to be diffusion, diffusion, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and then osmosis. <clears throat> Diffusion is just the movement of any small particles across the membrane um, until a state of equilibrium is reached. So again, this doesn't require any energy. This is still from a high concentration to a low concentration. This is what molecules want to do. So make sure you put that whole definition down there for a diffusion. The movement of small particles ac across a membrane until equilibrium is reached. And equilibrium just means the molecules have spread out as much as they can. Think about when you are on a crowded elevator full elevator. As someone gets off, as you go down the elevator, what do you naturally do? You naturally sort of like shift and wiggle to spread out as much as you can. That's exactly what molecules do. Molecules don't want to be crammed together. They want to diffuse as much as possible. They want to spread out until they reach a state of equilibrium, which just means they can't spread out anymore. Okay, so there's an example of diffusion. So this would be like if I sprayed air freshener, the air freshener right outside of the can is gonna be at a very high concentration, and those molecules are going to spread out across the room until they reach a state of equilibrium. And that's why when you spray air freshener, the people close by smell it first, right? It's gotta diffuse until it makes its way all the way through the rest of the room. So again, traveling from a high concentration to a low concentration, this does not require energy. 
So next up, we're going to talk about osmosis, which is simply a type of diffusion, a very specific type of diffusion. It is the diffusion of water across the semi-permeable membrane, like the cell membrane. So it's a specific type of diffusion where you have the movement of water across the membrane. Underline, bold, highlight, capitalize the word water. It's the diffusion of water. So again, still going from a high concentration to a low concentration. This is what molecules want to do. Water wants to you know, spread out as much as it can. So it does not require any energy. So in the case here, we have a semi, in this picture here, we have a semi-permeable membrane that allows water to pass through, but it does not allow sugar to pass through. So you can see the sugar molecules are staying where they are, but the water molecules are going from where they're way concentrated over here to traveling over here, which is why the water level is increasing up here, until they reach a state of equilibrium. Since there was some sugar over here, that meant the water concentration was low. It had a high sugar concentration, so it had a low sugar, low water concentration. So the water traveled from a high to a low does not require energy. So again, here's what this looks like across the cell membrane. So if all these little shapes here are water molecules, here's the extracellular space, meaning outside of the cell. Here's the intracellular space. Those water molecules are literally going to squeeze their way through that phospholipid bilayer, and they're going to do that until they reach a state of equilibrium. You can see the water molecules are now equal both outside and inside. We've reached the state of equilibrium. That is what molecules want to do. It does not require any energy. So again, here is uh, where you have less solute, which means you have more water. And over here, you've got more solute, which means you have less water. Water travels from high to low. So if it was high concentration to low concentration over here, you're going to see an increase in the amount of water on the side where it was low. So now it's reached a state of equilibrium. We've got equal amounts of solute versus water on both sides. Okay, this slide is gonna have a lot of words up words on it. Before you write anything down, I just want you to stop and listen for a second. I'm gonna talk about three types of solutions uh, when you're dealing with osmosis. You can have hypertonic solutions, hypotonic solutions, and isotonic solutions. This is all dealing with the movement of water, osmosis. In a hypertonic solution, you have a high concentration of solute outside of the cell, which means you have a low concentration of water. So that means the water inside of the cell is higher than the water outside of the cell. So water is going to leave the cell, because remember water travels from high to low. So if water diffuses out of the cell through osmosis, the cell is going to shrivel up. Here's the way that I remember it. People that are really hyper are always running around being crazy, using lots of energy, which means they are always skinny, right? Hyper people, the super hyper people are always skinny. So in a hypertonic solution, the cell is going to get skinnier. It's going to shrivel because water is leaving the cell. In a hypotonic solution, this has a low concentration of solute outside the cell, which means a high amount of water. So if water is going to travel from high to low, it's going to travel into the cell. So in a hypotonic solution, water is going to travel into the cell, which causes the cell to swell and maybe even burst. So the way I always remember that is in a hypotonic solution, a cell is going to get as big as a hippo. Hypo, big as a hippo. Hyper, you get skinny, right? You shrivel up. In a hypotonic solution, the cell is going to swell. And then that leaves us with our third osmotic condition, which is an isotonic solution. In an isotonic solution, you have equal concentration of solute and water, both inside and outside of the cell, which means water is traveling in and out of the cell in equal amounts. So water diffuses into and out of the cell at the same rate, which means the cell is going to stay the, the size that it should. Okay, so here are some examples of cells in each of those solutions. So on your notes organizer, tell me what happens to a cell when it's placed in each solution. In an isotonic solution, this is ideal here. Equal amounts of water going into and out of the cell. This is normal, right? Here's a red blood cell in an isotonic solution. Here's a plant cell in an isotonic solution. In a hypotonic solution, remember water is high outside, so it's going to travel inside, which is going to make the cell swell up, and hopefully it doesn't make it burst, but it might. Okay, so that's not good. We do not want cells to be in a hypotonic solution. 
In the case of a plant cell, this can be considered normal, right? Because cells, plant cells want to be able to store lots of water. So in this type of in this type of solution, a plant cell would be okay. And then in a hypertonic solution, remember water is high inside, low outside. So water is gonna travel from inside the cell to outside the cell, which means that it's going to shrivel up. So in a hypertonic solution, water leaves the cell, causing the cell to shrivel up. Okay, so in the case of, you know, if we took a Elodea cell, which you looked at in the microscope, and we put salt solution, it would cause the water that's inside the cell in the Elodea, the aquarium plant, to leave the cell. It would cause the cells to, you know, send a rush of water outside of the cells, which is why you would see sort of a wilting in the plant. You do not want to put Elodea, which is a freshwater plant, into salt water. And then the last type of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. So again, molecules traveling from high to low, but they just need a little bit of help. They don't need any energy, they just need a little bit of help. To facilitate something means to sort of help something along. So this is diffusion, but it is, it is the movement of larger molecules like glucose that have to be helped through the cell membrane. So they do that through the use of proteins, okay? There are proteins in the cell membrane that literally form channels or tunnels that allow large molecules to to pass through without any energy. So these are called protein channels. They're made up of proteins and they act just sort of like a tunnel. Okay, it allows materials to pass through the cell membrane that are a little bit too large to pass through that phospholipid bilayer. So again, this does not take any energy, right? Molecules are just traveling from high to low. They're just going through these helper proteins. Okay, they're either going through protein channels or they're going through these carrier proteins that sort of like squeeze the materials into or out of the cell. A protein channel is literally just like a tunnel. So you may want to write the difference there between a protein channel and a carrier protein under your facilitated diffusion section on your notes. Okay, so next up we have active transport. So we just talked about our types of transport that do not require any energy because molecules are moving from a high to a low concentration. That's what molecules want to do. In active transport, this is what molecules do not want to do. They do not want to travel from a low to a high concentration, so it does require energy. So under active transport, make sure you're writing low to high concentration, meaning energy is required, write that in big bold capital letters, and therefore molecules have to be pumped against the concentration gradient. This is like swimming upstream, right? Salmon don't want to do that, it's against the current, so it's gonna take a lot of work and energy on their part. The proteins that are gonna work in the cell membrane to move molecules with the use of energy are called protein pumps. These do require ATP, energy. So for example, body cells have to pump carbon dioxide out into the surrounding blood vessels to be carried to the lungs for exhalation. Blood vessels are already high in carbon dioxide compared to the cells, so energy is required to move the carbon dioxide across, across the cell membrane from a low to a high concentration. So there is active transport. Again, we have a carrier protein squeezing things along, but we're moving things from where they were low and we're putting them to a concentration where it's gonna be much higher. So that's not what molecules want to do, which means it's going to take some sort of energy. And in this case, that energy is ATP. <clears throat> Okay, so diffusion, simple diffusion, we have the movement of molecules through the phospholipid bilayer, high to low, doesn't take any energy. In facilitated diffusion, again, we have high to low, they're either just going through channel proteins or carrier proteins, but again, high to low does not require any energy. In active transport, we're gonna use those protein channels and those carrier proteins to move molecules from a low concentration to a high concentration, that is not what molecules want to do, so we have to have that energy for that process to happen. Okay, so the two types of active transport are endocytosis and exocytosis, and you could probably figure out what those two things mean. Endocytosis and exocytosis is how we get very large mo molecules, such as food and waste, into and out of the cell from a low concentration to a high concentration. So when molecules are being moved into the cell, that is called endocytosis. Endo meaning into, cyto meaning cell. So we're taking molecules into the cell. This would be how we get food into the cell, endocytosis. Exocytosis are how we get things out of the cell, exiting the cell, exo meaning leaving, cyto meaning cell. So here's a good example of the endocytosis exocytosis cycle. Okay, food molecules here, oh sorry, food molecules here are coming into the cell membrane. The cell membrane literally pinches off around the food particle 
carries it to wherever it needs to go into the cell. The lysosome might even digest it. And then those waste products are going to exit the cell through exocytosis. So endocytosis coming. So in endocytosis, particles are coming in, the cell membrane is pinching around, bringing them to wherever they need to go, and then in exocytosis, particles are leaving the cell. Active transport requires energy, low to high concentrations. That's it for today.